Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the God. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. The Prince of Pan Africanism. Absolutely. Peace and black power. Not Glad to be back, Johnson. brothers. What, what's this? It's the fourth time? Five. Five. Okay, this number five. five. Number yes, five. Sir. You know, Dr. Umar, you've become one of the internet's favorite people to meme, man. <laughs> I love it, personally. <laughs> I love it. What do you think of it? I don't know. On one hand, I appreciate the circulation of the message. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, I think sometimes they go too far to where they're trivializing a very serious message. Talk to me. You know, so okay. I don't want people to lose the centrality and the importance of my main message, which is the liberation of our people. Absolutely. And coming from a school psychologist's perspective, the need for us to make sure we're saving our boys from that school to prison pipeline. Absolutely. And I think sometimes that can get lost in all of the humor. Mm -hmm. So I'm not against it, but I wish it was a little bit more balanced to it. But at the same time, I can't complain because it has helped bring a lot more people to the message, and it has helped me save a lot more parents. Absolutely. How, how has the pandemic affected affected you just overall? Uh, when the pandemic hit, I had just began a national black parent boot camp training tour. So mm-hmm. what we do is I go to every state. And I do a 12-hour seminar. So this is from 8 in the morning to 8 at night. That's why we call it a boot camp. Mm -hmm. And in those 12 hours, I teach black parents everything they need to know in order to protect their child. Mm. So each of those 12 hours is spent on a different topic. Mm -hmm. So we just did one last weekend in Boston. So we're going over all the disabilities, the IEP, how to conduct yourself at a meeting, uh, autism, Mm -hmm. uh, how to write the letters, uh, how to deal with behavior, how to review the psychological evaluation, Mm -hmm. how to review the IEP. And so I give them everything that I think a parent needs to know to effectively uh, advocate for their child in the school meeting. And when the pandemic hit, we had just finished the California training in Long Beach, and then we were shut down. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't done a training since March the 6th of 2020 until I'd done it last Saturday in Boston. Wow. So it's been 13 months. Wow. And what's, now, last time you were up here, we were talking about your school and, and yes. the school that you opened. What FDMG school? Academy. The Frederick Douglass right. Marcus Garvey Academy. It's a bittersweet report, brothers, because... Let me make it real simple so y'all can understand this. We have two schools, right? They look across the street at one another. The Marcus Garvey building is the elementary school, and the Frederick Douglass building is much larger. It's the high school. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were focusing on the Garvey building right now, right, if you were to say, how soon can that building be ready? It can be ready in three weeks. We only have three weeks worth of repairs, three weeks worth of HVAC, three weeks worth of electric, three weeks worth of plumbing. Mm -hmm. So if, hypothetically speaking, if a black tradesman, a black HVACer said, I'm going to come volunteer, I'm going to fix the system, you have to pay for all of the materials, but I'm going to donate my time. Mm -hmm. If an electrician, if a plumber said, we're going to donate our time to fix the system, but you have to pay for all the material. The school would be up and running in three weeks. Mm -hmm. That's all we have. Mm -hmm. The problem is, Charlemagne and Envy, is I haven't come across black folks who are willing to donate their time. That's one. Mm -hmm. So we have to raise enough money to pay market rate for those repairs. Mm -hmm. So the HVAC, the bills that I'm getting are ranging from two fifty on up. Uh, the plumbing, the bills I'm getting are ranging from like a buck fifty on up. You mm-hmm. see, mm-hmm. so we have to raise about three hundred thousand dollars just to handle that. Where if we had some black folk who was willing to donate their time, the school would be up and running in three weeks. I wonder if people, if they change their perspective of how they look at this, right? Like you bought the building, but I would look at it like a startup. Outright, we own it, no mortgage. Yeah, I would look at it like it's a startup. And this is what you're doing. In good shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The schools are, they're modern and not old. Mm -hmm. This was a charter school that was renovated at the tune of $13 million back in 2010. Mm -hmm. This is 2021. Mm -hmm. The school is only 10, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. They are modern. They're in good shape. The only thing we have to do is the plumbing, the electric, and the HVAC. We don't have to do no new construction. Mm -hmm. It's only repair. And that's why it's so frustrating for me Mm -hmm. because it's only three weeks worth of repairs, not a month, not a year, three weeks. Worth the repairs in the school could be up and running. So if I were Mexican, the school be done. If I were Chinese, the school be done. Mm-hmm. If I was East Indian, if I was Arab, if I was European Jew, if I was Italian, the school be done. Mm-hmm. It's only because it's us 
that we don't take something like this as serious. So it's like raising you, uh, it's like raising money in another round for a startup company. Raising the money in another round for like a startup company. Well, give them, tell them what they send donations, donations, donations. Well, the donation should go to uh, cash.me slash FDMG school. Mm-hmm. So if you're on the cash app, it's dollar sign FDMG school. If you're PayPal, it's paypal.me slash FDMG academy. Okay. So cash app is FDMG school. PayPal is FDMG academy. They can also mail check a money order. And that information is on my website at drumarjohnson.com. They can also join the loyal donors club. So that's an automatic contribution every month. $50 a month bronze, $100 a month uh, silver, $250 is gold, $500 is uh, platinum and a thousand dollars a month is diamond. Gotcha. Why, why do you think that you know you said if you were Mexican or if you were uh, Asian, why do you think that that black people don't want to support or is not supporting or do you feel that you know you're not getting the support that you should be getting? Now here's the point, and that's a great question, Envy. It's not that black people don't support other black people. We are not used to being responsible for building our own institutions. Mm. Are you following mm-hmm. me? Mm-hmm. If I was opening up a nightclub, some sort of a summer a basketball league, I would have the support. But we are not accustomed to being responsible for building our own institutions. So, mm-hmm. for example, if you look around America, can you show me a single independent black community in 50 states 50 states, you can't show me one black community where we own the hospital, the bank, the school, and the supermarket. And the reason I point out those four institutions, Envy, is because you need the supermarket to feed the people, Mm -hmm. the school to teach the people, the hospital to save the people, and the bank to invest in the people. So those are the four essential institutions of an independent community. You don't have those four in any black town Anywhere in the United States, and we are a $2 trillion people. How do you explain that? And I would say slavery, one of the psychological residuals of slavery, it took from us that natural desire to want to control your environment and your destiny. Mm -hmm. If you notice, when ethnic nationals come to America, the first thing they do is look for where are we going to build our first community. That's the first thing, Mm -hmm. because it is natural to want to control your environment. Mm -hmm. It is natural to guarantee your children their future. Black people don't do that. Mm -hmm. When When we wake up, the first thing we think about is what can I buy to make myself look more important than other black people? Mm -hmm. You see, so our whole orientation towards life is different from other groups as a result of slavery. What would you say to people in Atlanta who'd be like, well, we are a black city? Okay, but if you look closely at the statistics in Atlanta, Mm -hmm. and I just came back from Atlanta and I'll be there again uh, for Juneteenth, and shout out to South Fulton Councilman uh, Mark Baker who brought me down to speak at the Unity Day last weekend. When you look at the statistics, though, in Atlanta, when you look at the homelessness and when you look at the high school completion rate for black boys and when you look at the property ownership Mm -hmm. I do not see this black Mecca uh, proof, propaganda proof that people are talking about. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. Atlanta is progressive and it is doing better than a lot of other cities for black people. But I'm still seeing those same core issues that that five headed demon or that five headed dragon has brought to the black community. When I talk about the five headed dragon, I'm talking about the miseducation, the economic castration, the mass incarceration, the gentrification and access to wealth. Atlanta still has all those problems and the numbers are not low, not to mention the extremely high black male HIV AIDS rate, which in Atlanta is higher than it is for many second and third world nations around the world. Wow. Do you think the pandemic truly exposed the issues of public schools in the black and brown communities? I think the pandemic exposed how disorganized black people are. I think the pandemic exposed how uh, our lack of institutional infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, though, the silver lining was that the pandemic gave black parents an opportunity to teach their own children. And I think a lot of black parents learned as a result of that opportunity that they can do this. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of parents who are contacting me, Dr. Umar, we need some coaching because as a result of the pandemic, we started homeschooling our children and we're liking our success. Mm -hmm. So we're not sending them back. 
we're going to finish this out and we need you to help us out with that. So I like the fact that it gave black parents an opportunity to show themselves mm -hmm. that educating your own child is not as difficult. It's good for the parent to see my child don't have a reading disability. He just needed to read more. Mm -hmm. My daughter don't have a math disability. She just needed to practice her math more. My son don't have ADHD or conduct disorder or oppositional defiant. He didn't need Ritalin or Adderall or Concerta or Metadata or Cycler. He just needed a more rigorous disciplinary program. So a lot of parents have been able to disprove the labels mm -hmm. that the school has given their children. What's, what's your biggest issue with, with the public schools? My biggest issue with the public schools under the remote learning platform of COVID, I got a couple issues. Issue number one, these schools, while our children are learning at home, are still trying to get them tested for special education. Why, if, if he's at home learning through a computer, of course he's not going to be as motivated. That's right. Of course he's not going to do as well because he has to learn through a computer. Children don't learn from computers. They learn from people. If the teacher was boring in the classroom, she's going to be extra boring through the laptop. That's right. So there's a process loss there that public schools are not taking into account, Charlemagne. And as a result of that, they're sending parents letters requesting permission to evaluate your child. Are you are you kidding? No, I I'm telling right. parents you don't sign that. Or... Because even if you sign it, Charlemagne, they get evaluated. School psychologist, which is what I am, comes back and says he has a reading disability. Okay, how are you going to deliver his special ed services if he's at home? If he can't learn through the computer with the regular teacher, what is your special ed program going to offer this boy or girl that's going to rectify that? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing. So the schools are using this as an opportunity to get paid because every time you put a child in special ed, the school gets more money. So this is just a quick hustle. And I'm telling black parents, hell no. If you want to... Uh, improve their academics, bring them back into the classroom. Because guess what? As much as a lot of children did not like going to school, a lot of them are ready to go back now. They've been home too long. That's right. And even though some school districts have converted to hybrid where they go to class two or three days a week, two or three days at home, a lot of them have not. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing from children on the street, Dr. Umar, I'm ready to go back to school. But there's a discrepancy between white suburban public schools and black inner city public schools. They're showing that amongst the white suburban public and charter schools, 60% of them and greater are back in school. But when you look at the black inner city hood schools, 40% and lower are back in school. You know why? Because the white teachers aren't as motivated to go back into the school and teach the black kids, but they don't have a problem going back into the school to teach the white kids. Mm. So the white kids are back in the building. Mm -hmm. The black kids are still at home. It's racism. And, and unfortunately, and we've talked about this before, the white teachers unions, the American Federation of Teachers and the National Education Association, their job is not to make the teachers accountable to our children. Their job is to make the teacher's job as easy as possible. So as long as the middle class teachers of America can ride out this COVID thing as an excuse to not go back into the classroom and teach the children, they're going to do it. Don't get me wrong. COVID is a concern. Mm -hmm. I understand that. But guess what? All those white kids learning in the suburban public schools, I'm not hearing about no epidemic of an increase in COVID. I'm not hearing about nobody being carried out on stretchers. I'm not hearing about kids uh, recontaminating other kids. There's been almost no concerns at all. So if it can work for the white kids in the suburbs, why can't it work for the black kids in the hood? Mm. You mentioned special ed classes and, and ADD and ADHD. Do you believe those things exist or do you think it's just a way for teachers to be lazy and there's ways for school to make more money? I'm glad you asked that question. The reason I ask that, let me just say the reason I asked that because as a child, at me being a kid, I don't ever remember hearing cases of ADHD and ADD. I don't remember hearing that. Even with like kids talking now about I'm depressed and I'm doing this. I, I didn't hear that as when I was a teen, but I'm hearing it more now. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, you don't get ADD till 1980 in the first place. So the, uh, they dropped off ADD in 1980, and then they revised it and added hyperactivity in 1987. You see, so, you know, it just started coming upon us around that time. So what happened then was when the, the drug companies started invading the public school, and they started invading the public school by paying for the teacher conferences, making donations to the to the low-income school districts, you see. Mm -hmm. So now the teachers are getting packets in their uh, mailbox. If the child can't sit still, maybe you should have the parent get them evaluated. You see, so the drug companies have done an excellent job 
of infiltrating and invading the public school culture to the point now every child knows what ADHD is. Every teacher thinks they can diagnose it. Every parent knows what conduct disorder is. The drug company has succeeded. The drug companies have succeeded in normalizing mental illness in the public schoolhouse. Nobody should be that comfortable throwing around words like ADHD. Nobody should be that comfortable throwing around medical uh, 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 names like Ritalin and Adderall and Concerta and Metadate, but they know what they are because the uh, drug companies have spent so much money making children, parents, and teachers think it's okay to take these drugs, which in many versions are only a molecule or two away from the same crack cocaine that is sending so many black men to prison. So how is it acceptable to give children drugs, but you will lock their father up if you catch them with it? If drugs are no good for adults, they should likely be no good for children. And these drugs come with a lot of very dangerous, irreversible side effects. But the other point to uh, Envy's question is this. Most of our kids who are classified with specific learning disabilities, right? That's one category. Now, special ed is 13 categories. Special ed is blindness, hearing impairment, mm -hmm. orthopedic impairment, multiple disability, developmental delay, autism, emotional disturbance, intellectual disabilities. There's 13. You can fail, you can fail a standardized test and they'll put you in special right. ed classes. But yeah. here's the thing. Of the 13 disabilities, four of them are the Jim Crow. Of, of special ed. Talk to me. The learning disability, mm -hmm. intellectual disability, emotional disturbance, and other health impairment for ADHD. Most black kids in special ed are in there for that. They're not in there for speech. They're not in there for blindness. They're not in there for hearing problems, orthopedic issues. No. Learning, emotion, intelligence, and behavior. Mm -hmm. You see, mm -hmm. the problem with those four, Charlemagne and Envy, is they are the most subjective of all 13. In other words, if a child got a speech problem, you can tell. If a child is blind, you can tell. Mm -hmm. If a child is deaf, you can tell. If a child is emotionally disturbed, are you sure? Or does he just have a relationship problem with one teacher? See, according to the law, for you to classify a kid with an emotional disturbance, he's supposed to have problems building and maintaining relationships with teachers and peers. Teachers with an S, mm -hmm. peers with an S. But guess what they do? If a black boy can't get along with one white teacher, one teacher, they'll say he's emotionally disturbed. That's against the law. The law doesn't say you can classify a kid as emotionally disturbed because of one teacher. You're supposed to show a pattern. He can't get along with most of the teachers. He can't get along with most of his peers. But one relationship issue with one teacher and they'll slap him with an emotional disturbance because the parents don't know the law. And to that point, before I forget. By the way, they definitely had all that stuff when I was in school. They they was definitely trying to put me on Ritalin in elementary. My school. new book, Copy Black for Parent you. Advocate. Copy for Envy. Thank you, sir. Thank Copy you, for Angie. Thank you, sir. Now this new book here, Black Parent Advocate, follows up with my first book, which y'all have. Mm -hmm. And this book is broken into two sections. The first section gives our parents a whole bunch of sample letters that they can use to give to the school if they're having a problem. So if the school says, we want to test your son for a reading disability and you don't want that to happen, I have a letter that you can give the school. If the school says your son can't come back unless you put him on medication, I have a letter you can give them for that. Mm -hmm. If your child is in special ed and they haven't learned anything, although they've been in special ed for 40 and 50 years, I have a letter that you can give them for that. So the first half is letters parents can use to respond. Mm -hmm. Because most of the time when I'm helping on parents, I have to show them how to respond. Mm -hmm. The second half of the book teaches them how to understand the different documents that the school gives them. Mm -hmm. So if Charlemagne gets a psychological evaluation for your daughter, you don't know what this is, but I got a chapter in here that shows you how to understand it. What should be in it? What are the sections? How do you judge it? Mm -hmm. If DJ Envy gets an IEP for his son, he looks at the IEP. I don't know what this is. Well, mm -hmm. guess what I do? I break down the IEP, the different parts, the different components. What should be in it? If Charlemagne asks the school to put together a behavior plan for his son, you don't know what should be in the behavior mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. But guess what? I got it in here. Line for line, word for word. So if you get a report, you can open up this book right next to your child's evaluation and go section for section. What should be in here and how can I evaluate the quality of the work? Mm. You know, what are your thoughts on uh, HBCUs and, and those colleges? Like Master P was just on the show a couple of days ago and he was talking about his, his younger son just said 
he's going to Tennessee State, which is an HBCU. So what are your thoughts on HBCU and the education you get at an HBCU compared to an education, you, let's say you get at a, another university, a SUNY school or a CUNY school? Absolutely. And shout out to the HBCUs. Shout out to Alcorn State University down in Mississippi. I keynoted their Black History Month program uh, in February. I support the HBCUs. We need the HBCUs. They are responsible for no less than, no less than 50% of all black professionals in America. You would not have the amount of doctors you have. You would not have the amount of attorneys you have. You wouldn't have the amount of engineers, teachers, psychologists. The HBCU has single-handedly supplied the black middle class with a fresh generation of black professionals. So they are extremely relevant, extremely valuable. The problem I have, though, if I were to offer one criticism constructively, mm -hmm. most HBCUs do not teach their students black history. Let me say that again. As an undergraduate student at a historically black college in the United States, you are not likely to get a single course. There's no African-American studies courses? Very few. Wow. Very few. You have over 100 HBCUs, and almost none of them offer black history as a general ed course or requirement for their students. How can that be? How can I go to an HBCU and not learn who I am? Mm -hmm. How can I go to an HBCU and not learn where I come from? And I would argue that the reason why the HBCUs don't teach black history is because many of them are ran by the state. Others are financed by white philanthropy and in an attempt to make their funders as comfortable as possible, they have done away with teaching kids who they are. There needs to be a movement to bring black history into the black college. It's totally ironic. It's paradoxical. It doesn't make any sense, but it is an issue. Mm -hmm. And so one of the yeah. things that I'm trying to do is uh, offer for free if I have to an introductory course in black history for undergraduate HBCU students. We had like, we had a, a African-American history at Hampton University when I went, but my problem with a lot of HBCUs is their curriculum doesn't change, right? So for instance, my daughter was, uh, last year she was looking to go to college, right? So we went to every, you know, HBCU damn from here to Atlanta, right? From here to Florida. But the problem was, was she wanted to study real estate. She wanted to get into real estate. And not one HBCU had real estate as a major where they mm. teach them how to invest. Mm. You know what I mean? And that's my problem because mm. it's almost like I feel like sometimes we teach how to be workers and not entrepreneurs. So the only schools that had real estate classes and real estate majors were your NYU, mm. were those, those type of schools. And we went from everywhere from Morgan to, you know, to Howard, to Hampton, to Spelman, to Clark, to, you know, Schools in Florida, like we went to all those, and none of them had that as a major. They had a, a class you can take, but now if you want to be a major to figure out, you know, how do most people make their money? Tech, real estate, and we don't we don't offer those as majors. That's a problem. Absolutely, and I'm gonna add to that. Many HBCUs have reduced the amount of industrial and mechanical training programs that they used to offer. In other words, you usually could get licensed as a plumber to learn a trade HBCU mm -hmm. a license as a electrician through the HBCU licensed as a auto mechanic through the HBCU certified as a farmer through the HBCU and you still have many HBCUs who offer those industrial and mechanical training programs but a lot of them have not a lot of them have given them up and when you talk about the mass incarceration of black people, men in particular, and of course our sisters are catching up, you're talking about the de-industrialization of black America. Because up until 1970, you did not have to go to college to get a good job and live a comfortable life. You came out of high school or you graduated from the HBCU licensed as a roofer, licensed right. mm -hmm. as a carpenter, mm -hmm. licensed as a welder. Mm -hmm. Those were the skills that paid your bills. The problem with the college education, not to downplay it. I'm a doctor. I got six degrees, three universities. I'm not downplaying the college degree, but we have to understand something. The university gives you a competency. If Charlemagne has a degree in art history, you're competent. You have an intellectual knowledge base. Dr. Umar Johnson is a clinical psychology doctor. 
a certified school psychologist. I have an intellectual information base. But when you can work with your hands, you have a practical skill base mm -hmm. that you can apply immediately to get paid. If I can fix windows, I can fix anybody's window. If I can work on a car, I can work on anybody's car. I can get paid above the table or below the mm -hmm, table. Mm -hmm. But my family going to eat because I can use these hands. But Charlemagne, if my degree is in political science, I have an intellectual knowledge base. Mm -hmm. How can I apply that in the black community to get paid? If my degree, you know, is in a liberal arts, how can I apply that in the black community to get paid? Mm -hmm. Most of what we learn in college is not economically relevant in the black community, mm -hmm. but skills are. So if I were in charge, every black child, male or female, straight out of high school, would go to trade school first, mm -hmm. spend two years, get licensed or certified in a trade, and now you can go to college because you can afford to pay for it yourself. And if you can't get a job with your college degree, you can always fall back on these hands, i.e. the skills that pay the bills. I agree with you. I'm a big trade school proponent. Let, let's switch gears a little mm -hmm. bit, man, because, you know, uh, it's been a very dark week, right? People, yes, people, people feel like we can, we can breathe again. After the Derek mm -hmm. Chauvin verdict. And, you know, George Floyd's brother said uh, justice for Floyd means freedom for us all. What do, what do you think of that? But Floyd didn't get justice because Floyd isn't coming back from the grave. That's right. And I want to be very clear. I don't know what black America is celebrating. The Chauvin conviction was not a cause for celebration. And I want everybody to pump the brakes and understand something. No laws have been changed. No laws have been added to hold the police accountable for the unjustified murder of unarmed black people. That's right. So we are right where we were before Chauvin was convicted. And the only reason why he was convicted, to be honest with you, it had nothing to do with black justice. Derek Chauvin was convicted for the same reason O.J. Simpson was acquitted. Now, I don't know if O.J. Simpson was guilty or innocent, but that's irrelevant. The reason O.J. got off in 95... Is because the Rodney King riots in 1992 cost Los Angeles County untold millions of dollars in damage. They were still repairing the county when OJ went to trial. Do you really think they're going to let the city burn down a second time when we haven't done making the repairs from the first riot? It's the same thing in Minnesota. Now, listen, I'm not, I'm not, I don't disagree with that, but that's the same thing Fox News is saying. Fox News is, they're saying that it's because that people were protesting and some people were rioting and looting that the jury was afraid to convict Derek Chauvin. I don't like I don't that because it takes Derek Chauvin afraid. off the hook. Well, most jurors were white. Mm -hmm. You only had four blacks. You had two mixed race. The others was Europeans. Mm -hmm. I don't think the jurors were afraid per se, but I believe that they were very reasonable. And they said to themselves, this city just burned a year ago. Countless millions of dollars in damages that had to be paid out. If we do not convict him, it's going to burn again. And not only is Minnesota going to burn, half the cities in America are prepared for protests. Mm -hmm. And let me be clear. They were not concerned about the black protesters. The black protesters did not break the law. Mm -mm. They were concerned of the white anarchist groups and the white militia groups who are going to operate under the cover of the black protester to destroy infrastructure mm -hmm. and damage property. That's right. So they that's were right. not afraid of black people protesting. They were afraid of the white anarchist groups. That's why he got convicted, mm -hmm. because they didn't want to flip that price tag. It was not about black justice. It was white capitalism that convicted Chauvin. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that at all. But only, the only thing I push back on with that is the fact that I don't want people to think that what Derek Chauvin did wasn't wrong. Because you no, saw it was wrong. It was exactly. It was absolutely exactly. wrong. And here's what makes the case so pathetic: the whole world saw what happened. Indisputable. And shout out to the teenager who taped the th the whole thing. God bless her or him. I it was, a, it was a young girl. God yeah. bless her. You know what makes the case so sad? We all saw what would happen. And yet everybody still was on pins and needles That's right. to see if he would be held accountable. That's right. And then you heard the judge tell him and his attorney that because of the comments that Queen Mother Representative Maxine Waters made, you may have grounds to appeal the case. Well, first of all, he can appeal the case anyway. But why did the judge have to remind him that you have the opportunity here to appeal the case? And because he doesn't have a, a record 
Under Minnesota law, Derek Chauvin could do as little as 12 and a half years and be home to enjoy the rest of his life. But here's a point I want you gentlemen to recognize. I want to go to President Biden. President Biden, your first day of office, you signed an executive order to protect the life and safety of transgenders. I have no problem with that. But you did it on your first day. But he sat up here with you, Charlemagne, and told black people that if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. So if you went out of your way begging black people to vote for you, why haven't we got an executive order or any other activity coming out of the Oval Office from President Biden to protect black people from police? I agree. Look what he's doing with the anti-Asian hate. President Joe Biden signed an executive order that is exclusive to Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. I don't have a problem with that. But if you can protect the Asian American and Pacific Islander from violence, why can't you do the same thing for black people? They've been dealing with violence for one year as a result of COVID. That's what it's called, the COVID-19 hate crimes bill mm -hmm. to protect Asians as a result of discriminatory treatment that they've been dealing with for how long? One year. Black people have been catching hell for four Hundred years, and we have yet to get an executive order from Joe Biden to protect us from the police and also Charlemagne and Envy to further highlight the racism of American government. The transgender executive order is not for people of color. It is not for minorities. It is not for disadvantaged communities. Guess who it's for? Transgender, the anti-Asian Pacific Islander hate uh, executive order against hate is not for people of color. It's not for minorities. It's not for disadvantaged Americans. It is exclusively and only for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Why am I bringing that up? Because when Barack Obama was in office, all these Negroes running around screaming for Obama, I still don't know why, was said that Barack Obama can't do nothing specifically for black people because this is America. And when we got the Civil Rights Bill in 64 and the Voting Rights Act in 65, they included two words at the end of that. One was gender and the other was sexual orientation. So the Civil Rights Bill did not only apply to blacks, it applied to everybody. So if you have to make laws for all Americans, Charlemagne and Envy, how do you explain the fact that the Asian Americans got a law just for them yesterday? The United States Senate in historic precedence, passed the anti-Asian hate crimes bill at a vote of 96 to 1. Now, to give you an idea of what that means, the Senate, they don't agree on nothing. The Democrats and Republicans, they filibuster each other to death. But yesterday they didn't. 96, only one person voted against the anti-Asian hate crimes bill. So can I ask you a question? If the Senate was able to pass the anti-Asian hate crimes bill, Charlemagne and Envy, 96 to 1, with almost no opposition, why is it that the Emmett Till lynching bill still has not been approved? Why is it that they have been over 200 different anti-lynching bills introduced in the U.S. Congress, 200, and not one of them has been approved by the U.S. Congress yet. But the first ever Asian bill goes through on the first try. Mm. Look at the racism. Look at the discrimination. Look at the bias. Look at the inequity there. And why are they catering to the Asians? You know why? Because the amount of white people in this country is shrinking. That's right. And whenever the amount of white people in America shrinks, America looks to find other white groups or other minority groups that they can build an alliance with to protect their power and their interests. Who better than the Asians? They're just as conservative politically as many middle-class white Americans. They are just as economically comfortable as many middle-class white Americans. They don't like black people just as much as many middle-class white Americans. Not to mention that this can go a long way towards building relationships with Asian countries on the continent of Asia that America can't afford to build an alliance with Russia. Let us be clear about something. The continent of Asia is a big problem for the U.S. government. You got three power nations on that continent. You got Russia that America can't stand. You got China that America can't control. And you got India, which is one of the fastest growing populations, and it is quickly becoming the IT giant of the world. 
Kamala Harris is not the vice president by accident. Kamala Harris is the vice president on purpose because America needed to send the nation of India an olive branch to improve their relations because America can't afford for India to get tight with China or Russia. This is politics. And they're going to use the Asians, okay, as probationary whites. They're going to upgrade them to probationary white status to make sure that they stay on the side of the white man and not go on the side of the black man. This Asian agenda is a distraction from the issues that are affecting black people. How do you sign an executive order for the transgenders, executive orders for the Asians? He has signed nothing for black people. And mind you, Envy and Charlemagne, there have been at least five notable police terrorism cases on Joe Biden's watch. You had the 16-year-old sister who was shot four or five times with the knife. Mm -hmm. And I don't want nobody to tell me that the police were justified. We're going to get to that. We, okay, we, we get to I got that. you. But yeah. the five, her. Mm -hmm. And then you have uh, Officer uh, Nazario, the African-Latino brother who was harassed by the police mm -hmm. in his car. Mm -hmm. The lieutenant. You had the yeah. brother, 17-year-old boy, murdered by the police in the bathroom Anthony in Thompson. Knoxville, Tennessee. Anthony Thompson, Jr. The other brother in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, who was shot yep. in the execution of a warrant. And I'm missing some, oh, Dante Wright, who mm -hmm. was murdered, and she thought it was a taser. Tasers don't look like guns. Tasers mm -hmm. don't feel like guns. They don't weigh the same as guns. And there's no way under heaven you accidentally thought a taser was a gun. But again, five cases, and the president still has not acted. The same president that told the Breakfast Club that if you black and don't vote for me, you ain't black. Well, why haven't you done anything for black people yet, Joe Biden? And don't forget about the George Floyd Policing Act. Oh, that still hasn't passed yet. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But you pass some bills for everybody else, but nothing for black people. And part of this is our fault because we didn't make no demands on Joe Biden before he got elected. We didn't make no demands on Joe Biden before he got elected. And you know why Joe Biden ain't going to do nothing about police genocide? Because, number one, it's acceptable in America for police to kill blacks. That's number one. And number two, he can't afford to isolate conservative Democrats and middle-of-the-road Republicans as it relates to him getting approved all the legislation he wants to get carried over during his presidency. Mm -hmm. So Joe Biden got to make a decision. I either got to stand up for black people, you understand, or I got to keep white people comfortable enough to approve my legislation. And what is he choosing? He's choosing his legislation over the lives of black folks. Yeah, I, I do disagree. A lot of people made demands of Biden, but then you had other people saying— No, 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 no. Not people, Charlemagne, as a community— well, that's, 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 make... that's hard, though, because black, black, black people aren't monolithic. We can never we get on the same be page. Because, because, Asians aren't monolithic, but they can still but, organize but, and but, put a platform out. Very true. But to my point, you had people that were putting platforms out, but, but, then you you had, but you had other people saying, no, we got to get Trump out. Don't rock the boat right now. Well, problem, Wait until Biden gets in and then make demands. Right. But the problem we made as a community is we made Donald Trump the scapegoat for racism. Just like mm. we made Barack Obama the angel, you understand, for government, we made Donald Trump the devil. You don't do either one of those. The U.S. government is a system. It's not a person. So when you make Donald Trump the scapegoat for all of American racism, you let the government off the hook. You don't reduce a system as powerful as this to an individual or a personality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The problem, which, I, which is what I think you're saying, so we don't disagree on this point, we are disorganized. And it is the disorganization that makes it difficult for us to put forward a unified platform. Mm -hmm. So what happens is people are self-anointing themselves as the representatives of black people. Look at the Congressional Black Caucus. You got, what, 57 uh, uh, black representatives in the House. You got two black U.S. senators. That's almost 60 people in the Congressional Black Caucus that's been around since 1971. Mm -hmm. What has the Congressional Black Caucus done since 1971? But let me ask a better question. Why hasn't the Congressional Black Caucus demanded that Joe Biden issue an executive order against police genocide of black people like he did for the transgenders and the Asians. Why are our black elected officials sitting there quiet on Capitol Hill watching our people get assassinated like this when they're right down the street from the president? And I'll tell you why. They're Democrats. And when you're a registered Democrat, you're part of a team. You're part of a club. And you can't go too hard because we will lose middle-of-the-road Republicans and conservative Democrats in the midterm elections. So all those blacks in the CBC got to be quiet, shut up, 
swallow their pain and deal with it because you cannot rock the boat or you will mess up the whole Democratic agenda. That's why I do not vote for black people who are registered as Democrats or Republicans. I only vote for independent candidates because if you are not an independent candidate, you don't have an independent program, you are not an independent thinker, and you ain't going to bring us no independent freedom. The Democrats are a waste of time. If the Congressional Black Caucus can't make Joe Biden do anything for black people, then they need to dissolve themselves. We don't even need them anymore. They're useless. Do you believe there is any policy or legislation that will stop police executions of black people? Like, you think, like, if they implement the George Floyd Policing Act, will it stop the executions of black people? I have to look closer at that act, Mm -hmm. but my suspicions are it doesn't really have any teeth in it. Mm -hmm. Because when I look at the act that Nancy Pelosi introduced, the police reform bill, right around the time that the George Floyd riots kicked off, it didn't have no teeth in it. First and foremost, the unjustified murder of a black person by a police officer, should automatically be charged as a hate crime. Number one, it is a hate crime. These police killing us are committing hate crimes, and nobody is treating them like hate crimes. So the first change in the legislation is that it all has to be treated as a hate crime. Second change in the legislation is the payouts. The civil suit payouts come from the police officer's pension, pension yeah. and it comes from the police union and it comes from the fraternal order of the police. Make them pay because you can't tell me that you're going to make black taxpayers pay. You understand for the criminal behavior of police. How am I getting a victory if I'm the one who has to pay for his mistakes? Uh, uh-uh. uh. Make the police pay and charge every murder as a hate crime, and I guarantee you they'll think twice before they start killing black yeah, folks. Yeah, in the George Floyd Policing Act, uh, that's what they want to do. They want to get rid of qualified immunity because if you get rid of qualified immunity, then that's exactly what'll happen. Exactly. You yeah. need to get rid of qualified immunity mm-hmm. and stop making police think that their lives are more important than black folks. Look at the situation with the sister. Who got shot the five times? Now let's four, talk about that. Makaya Maca- Bryant in Ohio. Makaya Bryant. Yeah. They're claiming, and she the one who called the police. Mm-hmm. They're claiming that the police had a right to shoot her. Even coons, Negroes are running around saying, well, she had a knife. So that justifies her being killed? Because I work in school, Charlemagne. I have seen lunchroom aides dis- with no police training, mm-hmm. no bulletproof vest, no nightproof vest, no gun in their pocket. I have seen elderly black women and elderly black men take knives and other weapons out of the hands of students during lunchroom riots. So you mean to tell me that a 60, 70-year-old man can disarm a teenager in a lunchroom, but a trained armed police with a bulletproof vest can't get a knife out of the hand of a 16-year-old, but yet and still you have white males who are conducting mass murders all across this country almost every other week We're getting a mass murder in America, and almost every one of these fully armed, fully violent, murderous white men were apprehended by the police without being shot and without losing their life. So explain to me how a white man with an AK-47 can be taken without a police officer firing a bullet after he'd have murdered six, seven, eight people, but a 16-year-old girl with a butter knife cannot be apprehended without a bullet being shot. That is nonsense. They killed her because they knew they would get away with it. Now, I'm not going to lie. I must be a coon because I I don't agree with you on this one, and I'm going to tell you why. I agree with you. you. I do agree with you. Those people that walk walk around with them assault rifles and those those white boys that they run around that don't get shot, they should get shot immediately. You come out with a gun, should lay your ass down. Not even a question asked. Yes. This situation, my only thing is this. When the police pulled up, now you're talking to somebody whose father's a retired cop, right? Yes, sir. And when that cop pulled up, he doesn't know friend or foe. He doesn't know who called the police, right? Okay. He, he does not know. He does, it, it wasn't Understood. like a sign of, hey, Understood. I called the police. Understood. Got a, they got a call, hey, I, I'm, my, my, uh, I'm getting jumped. Somebody has a weapon, right? Okay. Comes out that call. He, he puts his hand out. First thing he says is you see that girl running towards the other girl with the knife up. Okay. Right? Police can use deadly weapon to two things, to defend himself and defend another person. Okay. He fired his firearm, stopping that girl from getting shot. Now, people could say four times, five times was a lot. That was a lot of shots. You could take that any which way you want. Yes. But his whole thing was to disarm that girl. And at first, I was upset. Why the fuck they shooting that woman? But then I had to sit back and said, let's say that was my daughter sitting on the back of that car and somebody was coming at her aggressively with a knife. 
She wasn't uh-huh. defending herself. It wasn't like she was defending. She was coming aggressively for that other girl. Well, she was That's defending cool. herself, though, Envy. You can't do that. Right, I mean, they, they, came, jumped. They, had, they jumped her before, and they came to her right, house. That was her problem. But at this point right here, when I, I'm telling you what the cops seen. Mm-hmm. The cop didn't see the fight. Okay. The cop okay. only seen was the girl being aggressive to the other girl. That's all he seen. Okay. So at that point... If I'm the father and that's my daughter, I would want to make sure my daughter didn't get stabbed. Okay. And that was the only reason I said I understand why that cop did that. But shit. she shouldn't be dead. Four times is excessive. There, there, he, there was other ways I think that cop could have intervened without right. killing but, that girl. But that goes into training. Cops are trained to kill. But let They're me give you a follow up, Envy. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you yes, a question. Sir. If yes, you are the police, correct? DJ Envy is the police officer. You get out the car. You saw the exact same set of circumstances. Do you shoot her five times? Why or why not? I am not going to shoot her five times. Why? Honestly? Yes. Because this is my community, and I know what happens in the community. I understand the fight. In other words, you value her life. Right, but I'm going to tell you why. Exactly. And and this is going to be a little different. he took her life because he did not value it. Right. Let me I ask you another at, question, Envy. If she was a white girl with that same knife, does she get shot five times? If I'm a police officer? That white, if that, well, not you, with the white, going back to the white officer. If, a, if the girl with the knife was a white girl and that was a white neighborhood, does she get shot at all by no. that same cop? gun never I even comes out. So. I would hope so. If she's aggressive. No, no, no. I didn't ask you what you hope. hope. I didn't ask you what you hope. Does I mean, that I, I don't know. I'm not a psychic. You know it wouldn't, Envy. I don't know. I'm not a psychic. Envy, you know it. You know she wouldn't. Envy, you know she wouldn't have got shot if she was white. I would hope, I would, I would hope so. If if uh, if anybody is aggressively going at somebody with a knife, I would hope that they Envy, get shot. Envy, how many? Vid- Yo, they got a video of a of a white guy stabbing a cop in the neck. The cop goes, oh, I'm stabbed in the neck. He pulls out his gun, chases the guy, stops in the middle of the chase to pull out his taser to tase the white Absolutely. guy. Absolutely. Come on. The point that I'm trying to make that guy Envy, immediately too. And you said what? it yourself, Envy. You said they're trained where they can shoot. They're not required to shoot. In other words, police are expected to exercise discretion like any other professional. He made a decision. And when you look at the video, I didn't hear him say stop. I didn't hear him say drop it. If I'm not mistaken, he did. He did. He did. He did do that. He did do that. He did. Yeah, he did. Because I did. didn't see it or he hear did. it. He did. But even he if did. he did, and she said, and she said, I'm gonna stab the fuck out of you. So like I'm saying, so why ain't case, shoot her in the leg? In that case, you know, you're right, but they're not trained to do that. Like it, it seems something. It's a bigger. If she than was just white, she would not have been I shot at all. Person. So you can't blame it on the training, Envy. This was racism. I posted a video yesterday. This was racism. I posted a video yesterday of a white man. The question: If she didn't shoot her. Uh huh. And that girl would have stabbed that girl and killed that girl. What would everybody would have said? The cop didn't do anything. I'm going to argue that it would have been impossible for her to kill the girl because the police, who are athletically fit, could have engaged her in less than five seconds. He could have tackled her. He, he could have tased her. her hit her with rubber bullets. She would have been stabbed by, bullet. this. Stabbed by this. She was already in motion. She no, man. She, no, already, nah, she, she knocked, nah, down, she knocked nah. down one girl before she got to the girl in the pink. Cop was right there the whole time. So the cop watched her knock down one girl and then go to the next girl in the pink. He could have intervened any time between them. But I'll give you another one. What about the 17-year-old brother in the Knoxville High School bathroom? Did you see that video? Yeah, Anthony Thompson Jr. I haven't All watched the video yet. All four or five police was in the stall with him. You know how small a stall is. Now, first of all, I got an issue with his girlfriend's white mother. And I said, white mother, yes, because when she called the police, she told the police that he carries a nine millimeter handgun. Mm -hmm. So she's prepping the police to already see him as an armed and dangerous emotional black male. Why did you tell them he had a nine millimeter? Why was it necessary for the white mother to tell the white police that her daughter's black boyfriend carries a nine? So the police are already primed. Or she wanted him dead because she wanted him in trouble. Or she wanted them dead. Thank you. Thank you, Envy. So we agree on that. Now, dealing with the police in the stall, Envy, and we never saw the gun. So I don't know if that was a gun in in his waist or not because we never saw it. But if you got four police up on a brother, he's a short brother, skinny little dude. You mean to tell me y'all can't grab his hands and arrest him? You mean to tell me he had to die in the bathroom with four police gripping him up and holding him down? They took his life because they wanted to. I've, I've heard. I've heard that these he, are executions. I heard the cop actually shot himself. 
The cop actually shot himself by accident, and all the other cops thought that the kid Which was shooting. Which speaks to how close they were in yeah. proximity. Yeah. If he was white, does he die? No. So the point that we're making is not that these situations aren't tense. It's not that they're not dangerous. It's not that the police are not stressed out. We're saying because white people in America have historically and systemically devalued black life, it has created a context where it is justifiable to kill for police to kill black people even when we are innocent. That's the point that we're making. Yeah, fatal force that, is always the option when it comes to black people. Always the option. I posted a video yesterday. A white guy has a knife. He's in front of the cop. He says, you're about to die. He's swinging the knife at the cop and everything. The cop never once reaches but for his gun. But take it to another level. Look at the Capitol riots. Oh, yeah. Was that January 6th? January 6th, yeah. A whole mob overran the governmental complex of the most powerful <laughs> white government in the world. And the police almost did nothing at all. Yeah. You had five yeah. deaths related to the situation, but they were mostly accidental. They overran, they looted offices, they was hanging off of the building, and then in the aftermath of the whole thing, you saw elected white politicians defending it. They said it was their constitutional right to show up and do what they did. If she black folks had done the same thing, we would have been mowed down like dogs. Yeah. And check this out. Check this out. They overran the Capitol because they lost an election. We are out here losing our lives every day unjustifiably to the police. What if we would have overran the Capitol for Breonna Teller? What if we would have overran the Capitol for uh, Sandra Bland or Tamir Rice? What they would have done, they would have killed us. And speaking of Tamir Rice, his mother is asking President Biden to reopen her son's investigation. Joe Biden has not responded yet. You know what he's doing? The same thing Obama did for black people. Not a damn thing. <laughs> and let me ask you a question. Last time you came up here, you got a lot of flack. And I'm just curious. Over if what? Were, what was it? What was it over? If, what, your, what if your opinions changed. You were saying that uh, you feel that black men shouldn't or black women shouldn't date outside of their race. Did you and not hear the Anthony Thompson Jr. situation? Thank you. I was going to go back to that, Envy. Anthony Thompson Jr. is dead because of, now his girlfriend was mixed race, so she was African. But the mother was white. He's dead because his girlfriend had a white mother. Dating outside your race is dangerous. If you don't believe me, look at Deshaun Watson down in... Uh, in uh, Houston. Houston, Texans. Most yep. of those massage girls were white. And we all know he didn't do it. The reason Deshaun Jackson is being lynched is because he wanted to leave the Houston Texans. And so the white power structure of Houston said, this Negro is not going to march into our city and think he leaves when he wants. We just had James Harden pull this same nonsense with the Houston Rockets. We are not going to let Deshaun Jackson pull it with the Houston Texans. And they're going to destroy that man's career because he wanted to walk out. The massage parlor talking about some. I came back into the room and he was totally naked. Aren't you a masseuse? Don't you touch naked bodies all the time? Isn't that part of your job? I never heard you say he raped you. I never heard you say he forcibly done something to you. Oh, he bumped me or he uh, moved my hand over. Excuse me? That doesn't raise to the level of a crime. And if you notice, he ain't been charged yet. Where are the charges at? 22 women, no charges? Because the man ain't guilty. They're trying to build Cosby to Sean Jackson. Because the new racism, Charlemagne, and the new racism, DJ Envy, is to make the victim look like a perpetrator. So white supremacy in the 21st century wears a disguise known as feminism. And white supremacy in the 21st century wears a disguise known as LBGTism. And white supremacy in the 21st century wears a disguise known as multiculturalism. Whenever we want to destroy a black man, if we want to get Charlemagne, if we want to get Envy, if we want to get Dr. Umar, we not going to give him with the traditional frontal white man assault, just outright destroy him because that's not a, that's not a politically accurate. We're going to find something DJ Envy said about gays or transgenders from 20 years ago. We're going to pull that up and use that to lynch him. Uh, we're going to find uh, something Charlemagne said about the anti-Asian hate propaganda and pull that up. We're going to find something Dr. Umar said about women 50 years ago and pull that up. They are lynching black males publicly an all-out war on black masculinity, and they're using feminism, multiculturalism, and LBGTism to do it. Deshaun Watson is innocent. Can you believe um, Brett Favre had the nerve to say that he doesn't believe Derek Chauvin intentionally killed George Floyd? What Brett Favre really said is, I don't give a damn whether black people are getting killed by police or not. That's what he really said. 
I don't care if the police are killing you or not. I don't want to be bothered with it. When I turn on a game, I want to watch the game. I don't want to be reading nobody's tweets. I don't want to be hearing no comments. I am a privileged white man in Mississippi. I'm a privileged white man in Mississippi, and my privilege allows me to not have to deal with the ramifications of police killing black people. Brett Favre ain't nothing but another old-fashioned, traditional, white, racist Mississippian. Yeah, he, he actually said that um uh, a few weeks ago. I forgot what show it was, but he said he doesn't want to hear any politics or social commentary during sports. And then he turned around and said he don't think Derek Chauvin did that on purpose. Exactly. And then you got all the black commentators on TV. They want to say the truth. They were, and I see Stephen A. Smith and Shannon Sharp. They want to say that he's just a racist. He understood, but they can't say that because that'll mess with their job. So they had to say, well, Brett Favre don't understand because he never lived as a black man. You don't have to have lived as a black man. You know what's happening. White people have been doing this to black people for four centuries. Brett Favre knows exactly what's happening, but he does not care. And that's why black parents need to stop letting their black sons wear these white football player and white basketball players jerseys until you know who they are and what they stand for. I can remember all the black men growing up who wore Brett Favre jerseys and now they're learning what Brett Favre really think about black people. Stop putting white names on the backs of black children. Mm. What are your thoughts on the blatant attack on black people's voting rights in this country? Well, white folks are mad. Mm -hmm. Doubly mad. Georgia voted Democrat for the first time in almost 20 years. The rednecks down south don't like that. Stacey Abrams handed Joe Biden Georgia on a silver platter. And they say, this ain't going to happen again. So now they down there rolling back the rights. And you know who it looks like they're targeting when you look at the, the new requirements? Black elderly and black ex-offenders. Now they're saying even if you send in an absentee ballot, you have to have ID. They want a driver's license or some other state-issued ID. Well, guess what, Charlemagne? If I'm an elder... And I'm 70, 80 years old on a fixed income. I don't drive. I ain't got no driver's license. And I ain't got time to go down to the state and stand in no long line to get some new state ID. I'm just not going to vote. They're taking away the convenience and the efficiency of voting to inconvenience ex-offenders and the black elderly so they don't vote at all. And then they say you can't give out no water or snacks in line. Charlemagne, if I'm out in the Georgia sun. I'm out in the Georgia sun, and there's 200 people in this line, and I got to stand here for about three hours, and I'm 70 or 80 years old with diabetes or cancer or whatever else I'm dealing with, or just good old-fashioned being an old person. I need a little snack. I need some fruit. I need some water. They won't even let them give them that. This ain't nothing but America taking us all the way back to Jim Crow justice and Willie Lynch law. We are reliving. And it's just getting started. We are reliving the 1920s through the 1960s all over again. And if you think the Georgia voting laws are something, have you seen that over 31 state legislatures have introduced new bills that will stem people's ability to protest? Mm -hmm. And these states are saying that if you get caught protesting, Charlemagne, and that protest mm -hmm. was not sanctioned, you will never get a state job. You will not get a college loan. You will not get public housing. You won't get food stamps. You won't get Medicare, Medicaid. And in at least two states, guess what they said? They are exempting motorists from any responsibility whatsoever if they run over protesters in the street who did not have a legal uh, permission to protest. Yeah, I read that the day after that the George Floyd case. That is crazy. Yeah, I read that the day after the George Floyd case. I'm like, yo, they trying to pass all these yes. anti-riot bills but not police reform? Exactly. They basically saying if you are a protester, we want people to run your ass over, kill you, and we don't want you to be held accountable for it. This is what America is all about. America has never changed. America has been consistent. And I'm going to take y'all back to Obama. When I was up here, I told y'all that by the time he get out of there, it was going to be worse for us because we didn't make him do nothing. What we celebrate him for? Look at what we going through. These police murders, they all started under whose watch? Obama. And he didn't do nothing about it. And after Freddie Gray got his spine snatched from his brain, what Obama do three weeks ago? He ain't changed no laws. He ain't signed no executive orders. You know what he signed? He signed that blue alert law, making it almost impossible for you to fight back against the police who trying to unjustifiably take your life. And now Obama all over the news talking about uh, he's concerned about police genocide. If you so concerned, President Obama, why didn't you do anything about it when you had eight years of your own? And you had two black attorney generals. I don't want to say things started under well, Obama. Holder, Holder, Holder resigned. 
No, yeah. we've always been. And victims then it was of police and then it was Loretta Lynch. Yeah, we've always been victims of police genocide, Charlemagne, but it had never been broadcast. Yeah, I think it intensified. It exactly, but the, the a, fact a, as a reaction to Barack Obama, I, yes, I and yeah. he did nothing about it. So the same black people who voted for you, you didn't even care enough about them to protect their life, and now you and Michelle running around selling that book. I don't care about that damn book. What are you doing about black people? You are an attorney. Obama is a whole lawyer. Michelle is a whole lawyer. Are they doing anything about mass incarceration? Are they doing anything to make the schools in Chicago better? Is Barack and Michelle Obama doing anything legally to help black people? Not a damn thing. And now you want to give your opinion on TV when you was president for eight years and did nothing at all. Mm. Let me ask you a question, Dr. Umar. Are you totally against interracial relationships? I am totally against it, and I want to make sure you understand why. Mm -hmm. It's not because... <laughs> Cut it out, Envy. <laughs> Cut it out, Envy. Don't do that, Envy. I'm going to be having a serious fact, conversation. We have a name for it. I, I want... We have a name for it. Okay. The snow bunny crisis. Okay. I am against the snow bunny crisis. And I want your white listeners to understand. Because people be trying to say stuff like, uh, he's the black Hitler. I'm not the black Hitler. I am, I am in no way interested in hurting or harming the life of any human. White, Asian, Chinese. I believe in respecting everybody. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm against interracial marriage Envy and Charlemagne is because marriage is an economic contract. It's an economic contract. Most women do not marry down in status. They marry up. And if you don't believe me, show me a rich white woman married to a broke ass black man. Have you ever seen a rich white woman marry a broke ass black man? No, you have not. And you never will because marriage ain't about love. It's not colorblind and it is totally economic. So if marriage is an economic unification in a contract, how can we who don't have enough already give so much to the white woman and to white people who have already taken too much when we got all these black women out here who will never get married. Only one out of every four black women in America will ever taste marriage. And half of them who taste marriage will be divorced within five years. If you want to save the black family, if you want to save the black family, you have to protect it. And in order to protect it, you have to be against interracial marriage. You can't say, I love the black family, but I don't have a problem with interracial marriage. Interracial marriage is eliminating the black family because it is not providing our women with enough uh, available and able black men to be their husbands. So you're so it's, not just white, it's, it's not just white women. You just feel white women, Asian. Everybody. Asian. Nobody why... should be marrying out the race because there's political consequences, DJ Envy. I'll give you one right now. Naomi Osaka. Am I saying her name yes. right? The tennis sister. Mm -hmm. Naomi mm -hmm. Osaka, yes. Naomi, I love her sister, right? She knocked off the greatest of all time, the GOAT, in Serena. But guess what? Who is she representing in the upcoming Olympics? Is she representing Haiti? No, she representing Japan. So here you have a half African sister, excuse me, an African sister with, because there's no such thing as half African, our genes are dominant. So you got an African sister with a Japanese mother. And instead of going back home to your father's blood, Haiti, to represent the Africans in Haiti, you're instead going to represent the Japanese who've never done anything for black folks and are part of the trilateral commission with the American white power structure. But who taught her to play tennis? Did her Japanese mother teach her to play tennis or did her black Haitian father teach her to play tennis? Her black Haitian father taught her to play tennis. It's the African DNA. It's the African ancestors in that girl that's responsible for her tennis success. But instead of representing us, she's going to go represent the Japanese. Well, I, this I, is what you got to deal with I, when you make mixed race African children. I, I think, I think I, no, 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 listen, hold on, hold on, baby. I think her case is a little different, why? though, because she identifies fully as a black woman. She definitely does. So if you identify fully as a black woman, Charlamagne, why is she not representing Haiti? I get it, but that's a little asterisk. Because if no, she, it's not she, an she, she no, because she's putting her money in the black causes, she puts her money in the black organizations. She got a black boyfriend. Like she, she, and she, and Envy, she stands up. For, she stands me, up for black do you causes. See what Haiti going through? Oh, 100 percent. So do you know what? I don't even know if Haiti got a tennis team, so I don't know. To be honest with you, they don't have to have one. She will win the whole thing. But here's the point. If you look at the political situation that America and France has Haiti in, that they've been in since the Haitian Revolution of 1791, if you look at the fact that the children are being raped, robbed, stolen by whites, if you look at the fact that America and France have sabotaged the Haitian economy and the Haitian society, if Naomi was to represent Haiti one time, she can go back and represent Japan next time. But if she was to represent Haiti just one time, it would shine a light on all the injustices that the U.S. government and the French government are inflicting upon yeah. our 
brothers yeah. and sisters in Haiti, and it will demand from the international community some answers and some changes. She has a chance to almost rescue an entire nation of people, and she won't do it because I'm she not won't say that. to the Japanese blood. Then why is she not doing it, I, brother? I'm not I'm not saying she hasn't, to be honest with you. I'm she pretty, hasn't what? Cause she's, she's not representing Haiti? She has not represented Haiti, but, and, but she speaks Olympics, out against so many black issues. She probably has spoken on Haiti. I don't know. Charlemagne. But I, not, but, I, but I do see her speak out a lot in regards to black issues. Okay, but until she speaks out for the Haitians and until she do something uh, significant for her father's people who are responsible for the talent that she got, her father's people, her father who taught her how to play tennis in the first place, if it wasn't for a Haitian father, Charlemagne, she wouldn't be in that position. Show love to Haiti. The point that I'm trying to make. Look, look that up, Dan. I'm asking the white man to look I something got you. up. Oh, he yeah, because I'm sure she, I, I think, I'm pretty sure I've heard her speak out against that. But the point that I'm making is if she represented Haiti mm -hmm. in the Olympics, here's what I'm saying, Charlotte. I mean, you can't take a small, soft act of activism and try to use that to replace a major, significant act of activism. You understand? Mm -hmm. Saying, making one or two news bites during the uh, context of a press conference is not the same as representing the Republic of Haiti on the international stage. Even if she says something, I don't care about that. You had a so chance what, what, to represent the people who are responsible for you being who you are, and you chose not to do it. I'm not knocking her. Mm -hmm. I'm a fan of her. I want to be clear. I'm not knocking my sister. In fact, I would probably have more criticism for her father because I want to know what you put in that little girl that has a run into Japan instead of Haiti to represent them in the Olympics. Here's the point I'm making. When you have mixed-race African children, these are the types of issues you're going to have to deal with because until African people born, get out of situation. She was born in Osaka. She was born in Osaka. So, that, that's, so that's why she has to play for them. Can I ask you a question, Envy? Yes, sir. If a white, if a European Jew is born in Africa and he plays tennis, is he going to represent Africa or is he going to represent Israel? Probably Israel. Thank you. So it ain't got nothing to do with where you're born. It's where your loyalty is. And until black people get organized, fellas, many of our mixed race children are going to identify with the other race because they doing better than we well, are. Well, maybe maybe she'll hear this and take 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 what you're saying I'm into sure consideration. I'm sure she will. Yeah, I'm yeah. not knocking her. I just want y'all to show. I just want y'all to see it does not benefit the black community to be having all these mixed race babies who are not loyal to us. I have nothing against mixed race. Cause they are be fully African in my opinion. I was going to ask you that. What do you think? I have of no problem with a okay. mixed race African. I judge all black people. I don't care if you're from Africa because I'm a pan-Africanist so it's all one family for me. I don't care if you're in the Caribbean, Brazil, Europe, Australia, the continent, Canada. Two things. Two things. Are you biologically black and are you psychologically black? And when I say psychologically black, do you identify with your primary race? Naomi does. You understand? Yeah, yeah. So if you are psychologically black mm -hmm. and you are biologically black, I treat you no different. I don't care if you high yellow with green eyes or blue, black, purple. I don't get into this color game because I think part of the petty differences we have as a people is we over accentuate this light skin, dark skin, nappy hair, straight hair thing too much. Mm -hmm. And it's killing us. It's the blood. The first color on this flag is red, red for a reason. It's the blood that makes you African. So I would never miss treat a mixed race African but I'll tell you one thing I'm gonna make sure they understand you will not perpetuate the snow bunny crisis <laughs> no to your point though I do I, Naomi definitely does because I didn't even know that she was from Japan because I don't watch tennis but one day I was watching a tennis match and I said that's why she got a Japanese flag by her name and then that's when I realized that her mother was Japanese and her, her father was yeah, Haitian because she's so pro-black and speaks out about issues so much I just thought she was a sister and I want to say this to Naomi Osaka you know what and, I mean and, so yeah and I gotta say this to black men because as y'all can imagine, I get a lot of email, hate mail and love mail. I'm sure. I got some of these snow bunny loving black men sending me messages <laughs> saying stuff like, why are you always getting on the brothers for dating out the race, but you don't get on the sisters for dating out the race? Well, first of all, you're comparing apples and oranges. You know why? Black women do not date out the race nowhere nearly as much as black men do. And they definitely don't marry out the race anywhere as near as much as black men do. And if we were not dating out the race more, then black women would have more options, which would subsequently 
cut down on their snow bunny crisis. So I do hold black women accountable. It is absolutely unacceptable for a black woman to let any oppressor in her heaven. Totally, totally. It is a sin against the ancestors to do that. But at the same time, I understand many of our sisters would not be doing that had the black man not done it first. We don't hate women of other colors, but we are loyal to the black woman. We honor the black woman. We want to see the black woman married, and we want to see the black family survive. Why do you think you see so many mixed race and biracial couples on most of your major advertising. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. Most of the commercials are inundated. They're either mixed race couples where both of them are mixed race or it's a black man with a white woman or a black woman with a white man. Do you know why they're doing that? They're not doing that to sell interracial marriage to black men. Black men have been in love with white women since times immemorial. Okay? They, they're selling the white man to the black woman. See, they want the black woman to think that there's a white man waiting for her somewhere. And, and the reason it's important for the black woman to think that there's a white man waiting for her somewhere is she will not stand up in defense of the black man when he's mass incarcerated and economically castrated. They want the black woman to forget about the black man so they can do away with the black man. That's why the Meghan Markle, Prince Harry situation gets so much attention in the black community. Because if we can convince little black girls that they can marry a white royal prince, which is total nonsense, then we don't have to worry about the black family being around much longer. And if you kill the black family, then you could genocide the whole race. So for you, it's not about... It's not bigotry, it's business. It's not big, bigotry. It's the business of saving black folks. Mm -hmm. If I run into a black man with a white wife, I'm going to still speak to her. I've had people come up to me, do you hate, <laughs> do you hate me? Because No, people come up to me in the, in the airport. Do you hate me because my girlfriend is white? No, I don't. But I'm disappointed in you, brother. Can I talk to you, Dr. Umar? I'm still a fan. Sure, we can sit down and talk, but you have no right to do this. This does not help our people one bit. I am a political pragmatist. That means any question Charlemagne Ants asks me, any question DJ Envy asks me, you know what I'm going to ask you in response? I'm going to say, how does this benefit black people? We, we, we about to close out because Envy got to go. But I do mm -hmm. want to ask you, you said that, you know, marriage is not about love. So when it comes to same-sex relations, it's not about love. When it comes to interracial, it's not about love. And if you think it's about love, have you ever went into a divorce court and saw people argue? about getting their love back. Oh, have good. you ever seen somebody but, say, I want half my love back? <laughs> have you ever seen DJ Envy? You ever been in divorce court and see somebody say, I gave him 20 years of love. I want half my love back. I ain't never seen nobody go to divorce court to get their love back. They go to divorce court to get money, property, assets, 401ks, and everything else. So when we, when we see you What's on... What's love got to do with it? When we see you on social media asking for a queen... I'm not asking for a queen. I'm letting the queens know that I have not chosen my queen. And if you think that you have what it takes to stand by the Prince of Pan-Africanism, I would like to know who you are because I'm so busy. I can't meet every woman. I'm too busy. But you choose it for business. Not like you're not trying oh, to. Oh, I'm choosing for business. Her head better be nappy. Her whole body better be natural. That's right. Her head better be nappy. Happy to be nappy. No weave. No perm. No straightening. No blonde hair. Listen, I opened up a revolutionary academy. The Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. We're trying to change the consciousness of African children. How the hell I'm going to be the lead of a pan-African institution and my wife got a blind weave and a damn head? Mm. What does that say about me? Show me who you love and I'll tell you who you are. And then, most importantly, I'm going to look at her track record of activism in the black community. Because a lot of sisters who are conscious... Don't do anything in the community. A lot of brothers who are conscious don't do anything in the community. That's why when people say we woke, everybody woke. Woke means nothing, Charlemagne. Woke only means you're conscious. But what are you doing? How are you making black America better? Are you building any institutions? Are you tackling any problems? Or are you just sitting on YouTube making videos, which is what 98% of the conscious That's community real. does? That's real. So we're not, not bad. woke. Ever we mean work. work. More work, yeah. less woke. So we're not going to have no white woman pop up from Philly. Hold on. We're not going to have no white woman. get no white woman. No white pop up from Philly. Talk about, I used to mess with Dr. Uma. Hell no. Okay. You never did that. No snow bunny crisis over here. In fact, I'm selling snow bunny slippers to raise money for the school. <laughs> if you dating out the If you date If you dating out the race, snow bunny slippers, $20, pink or white. You can get the pink toes or the white toes. Snow bunny slippers for all you Polish Negroes, no race pride having Negroes. Get your snow bunny slippers from the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy. But seriously, though. Oh, man. Dr. Lamar Johnson. The school will be renovated by the end of this summer. Yes, sir. We got 
the whole May, June, July, and August. Early September, we're going to have our first annual Unapologetically African Family First Conference and Festival right there in Wilmington, Delaware, 30 minutes from the Philadelphia airport. So we want all the brothers and sisters to please, please, please donate. Okay, so we can get the school ready and so everybody can come down, walk through and see the type of gift in the jewel that God has blessed us with. Give them the information to donate again. Uh, Cash.me slash FDMG school. I repeat, cash.me slash FDMG school. PayPal.me slash FDMG academy. Mail your check of money order payable to FDMG academy. It is tax exempt donation. You can claim it. P.O. Box 9634, Wilmington, Delaware, 9634, Wilmington, Delaware, 19809. If you want to work at the school, send me your resume, fdmgresumes at gmail.com. If you want to work at the school, your hair must be natural, and you cannot have the snow bunny crisis. <laughs> Give me your Twitter and Instagram, too, Dr. Twitter Umar. Twitter and Instagram, at Dr. Umar Johnson, Facebook, at Dr. Umar Ifatunde. Email D-R-U-M-A-R Johnson as Dr. Umar Johnson at Yahoo.com and phone number 8444 Dr. Umar. That's 8444 D-R-U-M-A-R. And I just want to say to black America, I know we going through a lot. The times is tough. We've been through worse. We will come through this, but we got to organize. Stokely Carmichael said, if you organize a little, you get a little done. If you organize some, you get some done. But if you don't organize at all, you don't get nothing done. The hmm. most honorable Marcus Garvey said, the greatest weapon used against the Negro is disorganization. So we have to organize, mobilize, energize, and then we can transform this society. Joe Biden, you owe us, and we ain't going to wait around. Make something happen, sir. Black people voted for you. You owe us that much. You gave them an executive order. Now give black people an executive order. That's right. Dr. Umar Johnson, add him. Don't add me. Don't add Envy. Don't add Breakfast Club. You got all his Twitters and Instagrams. Talk to him if you got uh, issues with anything he said. Black African power. That's right. Dr. Umar Johnson, it's the Breakfast Club. Good morning.